Hello there. My name is Danny, and welcome to Ale and Agony. I always sound like I'm really happy when I say that. Like I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be so happy when I say the word agony, should I? But I don't really know how else to to do that. But anyway, welcome on in. Let's get cozy and talk about murder. I do have a quick note for you before we get into the episode today because an official schedule has now been put into place for uploads which will be every other Wednesday. And before we get into today's case, let's start with the ale of this week's episode. I am drinking a German IPA and it's called BRLO. And I've had a look on their website and it says that there's no incorrect way to pronounce it. So... <laughs> it's a beautiful sunny day and we've had a fair few days of rain here. So it's been lovely to enjoy a new beer in the sun. Well, I mean, like, I'm inside, but I can see the sun out of my window. So get yourself cosy because I'll be telling you about the super weird case of Kenneth Parks. So let's crack it open. Let's take it back to May 1987 in Scarborough, Toronto. And it's May 24th to be exact, and it's 4.45 a.m. in the morning. The local sleepy police station was going through their normal early morning routine when a 23-year-old man bursts through the door, his hands are covered in blood, and he tells them, I think I have killed some people. This 23-year-old man is Kenneth Parks, who shows up to the police station on his own accord and tells them a patchy and far-fetched story. The night before, Ken was sat on his sofa at home watching Saturday Night Live, his wife Karen had gone to bed, and his five-month-old daughter was asleep upstairs. So Ken is sat there, chilling out, watching the telly, and he dozes off. And the next thing that he remembers is seeing his mother-in-law Barbara. She's laying on the floor underneath him. Her eyes are out of focus, her mouth is open, and Barbara is dead. And just imagine if you fell asleep in bed, you, right now, you're asleep in bed, all cosy, having a nice time, and then you wake up to this awful scene, wouldn't it be so, so scary? I mean, I think I'd probably assume I'm still sleeping. I don't know how long it would take for me to come to my senses to realise that I'm not asleep anymore. So as Ken starts to come around, he notices that he is covered in blood and he starts to freak out, like, what is going on? So Ken runs out of the house, he gets in his car, and when he goes to grab the steering wheel, he realises that there is a knife in his hand. So he throws it to the ground and speeds away to the local police station. Ken can't remember anything else, and when he arrives at the station, officers noticed through all of the blood that Ken's hands were severely injured. And I mean, they were wrecked. This guy had somehow managed to sever several flexor tendons in his hands. So driving must have been excruciatingly painful and near on impossible, I would imagine, because surely once you've cut through your flexor tendons, like surely all your grip and everything is gone. But Ken was completely oblivious and he hadn't even noticed that his hands were so badly cut up. So the police took Ken to a local medical centre because he needed to have surgery on his hands. And they were, of course, sceptical of this guy's story because according to Ken, he fell asleep on the sofa and the next thing he knows, he's awake and he finds his mother-in-law dead. And Ken said that he can't recall doing any of the following things. He can't remember waking up, getting up from his chair, changing over his clothes and putting on shoes, picking up his car keys, getting in the car, driving nearly 15 miles to his in-law's house, getting out of his car, opening the boot, 
grabbing his tyre iron, unlocking the front door with his spare key, and entering the home. The police did their part, they went over to Ken's in-law's home, and sure enough, they found Barbara dead in the living room. She had suffered multiple stab wounds to her shoulder, chest, and her heart, and she'd been beaten in the head with the tire iron, leaving her skull fractured. When the police went upstairs, they found Ken's father-in-law, Dennis, in bed, who had been stabbed and strangled. But miraculously, Dennis was still alive. After Ken came out of surgery, and after his not so much confession, but his whole, I think I may have killed people, and then the police finding dead people, they charged him with the first degree murder of Barbara, as well as the attempted murder of Dennis. And now they have to try and figure out why the hell Ken would do this to his in-laws. So what was the motive here, do we think? Like, what are your initial thoughts as to why this guy would have driven to his in-laws' home, brutally stabbed and beaten them, and then takes himself to the police station and claim to not remember a single thing? The police have a couple ideas on motive, and it turns out that 23-year-old Ken had a serious gambling problem. Ken was stealing money to feed his addiction any way that he could. He burned through all of their family savings. He'd taken out multiple loans. And I also read that he had accessed another family member's account to take money from without their consent. But Ken was forced to come clean to his wife, Karen, who he'd kept all of this from just two months before the murder. And this was because he was charged with theft for stealing over $30,000 from his employer. And in today's money, that's around $70,000. Like, this idiot was stealing all the money and was now facing prison time. So motive number one to the police was murdering Barbara and Dennis for Karen to access a form of inheritance, which could then be used to perhaps pay off debts or to be invested in even more gambling. Once Karen found out about the gambling, the lovely woman that she is, she stayed by Ken's side during his addiction and she wanted to face this together as a team. And I don't, I don't know if I could do that, to be honest, because he was putting his addiction before her, before their marriage, before their five month old child. And Karen also put their house on the market to help with some of the debts. And she also encouraged Ken to go to a gambling AA meeting, which he did actually go to. He attended it for the first time, just four days before the murders. Whilst at the AA meeting, Ken was told that it would be a good step forward to come clean to his family about the financial stress that he was under. And he would feel so much better by just getting this all off of his chest. So Karen and Ken, made the plan to tell her parents at the weekend about the situation that they were in. So the second motive that the police had was that Ken couldn't face telling his in-laws that he had put his family and their daughter in financial ruin. So he decided that murdering them was the next best step. And this motive just, it just doesn't sit right with me. It just doesn't feel right. Karen later told police that her mum and dad would have helped with the debt anyway, and they'd have given the money if they asked. And she doesn't believe that her husband would kill them, because apparently Ken and her parents were super close. It turns out that Karen was a runaway teen in her youth, and it was actually Ken who convinced her to contact her parents and rekindle their relationship. So Ken, Barbara and Dennis were all super close. So if Ken didn't do this... Who did? And then how did Ken end up at the home with no recollection of getting there? Following his surgery, Ken was interviewed by numerous officers and he told the same consistent story every time that had this huge gaping hole in it. So then the police turned to doctors for assistance on evaluating Ken's mental state and they tested Ken for the following. 
acute psychotic episodes under extreme stress, aggression during an amnesiac state, deliberate homicide with stress-induced amnesia, complex partial seizures with automatic behaviour, and that sounds like a bit of mumbo jumbo to me, but all of these tests came back negative. Ken didn't suffer from any of these. And they also ran tests for delusions, hallucinations, paranoia, and psychosis. And all of them were just a big fat nope. What they did find was that Ken was suffering from general anxiety and depression, which is like fucking duh. The guys just racked up a huge debt, lied to his wife, He's facing prison time, and he's also admitted that he's not slept properly for quite a while due to stress. And I would imagine having a five-month-old baby probably doesn't help with that either. So yeah, if I was Ken, I'd be feeling pretty anxious and pretty depressed. And after some more tests and questions, the doctors found that Ken had a history of being an occasional sleepwalker. Hmm... And what I learned during my research is that sleepwalking is actually hereditary and you can be predisposed to it. So if you know someone in your family that's a big sleepwalker, maybe you are too. I haven't ever been a sleepwalker that I can remember, but I do remember being told a story about when I was younger and apparently I got out of bed, I walked downstairs and... One of my family members was sat in the living room and I sat down on the chair and I just screamed at the top of my lungs and then I stood back up and I took myself back to bed. How I wasn't drowned in the bathtub after that I have no idea because that is freaky as shit. Like if I had a kid that came downstairs in a trance, sat down, scream at the top of their lungs and then just walk off I'd be like oh my god my child is possessed by the devil. <laughs> And if you're partial to a bit of sleepwalking, it's also commonly in conjunction with bedwetting, sleep talking, as well as being very difficult to wake up. And I'm incredibly difficult to wake up when I've had a few drinks, but other than that, I don't, I don't sleep talk or anything. So I personally don't think I'm a sleepwalker. I think it was just a one-off. So they've said he's a sleepwalker. Are you feeling skeptical? Because I am. And the medical team conducted two overnight sleep studies on Ken and found that he did indeed have a severe sleeping disorder. And they advised police that sleep disorders and high levels of stress could cause an episode of homicidal sleepwalking, also known as homicidal somnambulism. And just so you don't Google it too, somnambulism is literally just sleepwalking. They're the same thing. So let's dive a little deeper into this. Like what exactly is sleepwalking? Because as far as I knew, you know, you just, you get up, you walk around, you go back to bed, essentially. That's what I thought it was. I didn't think it's nothing serious. I don't know anybody that's a sleepwalker. So I wanted to know a little bit more about it. The NHS website states that it's when someone walks or carries out complex activities whilst not fully awake and it usually occurs during a period of deep sleep. This peaks during the early part of the night, so sleepwalking tends to occur in the first few hours after falling asleep. No one knows exactly why people can sleepwalk or why it's hereditary, but the following things can trigger sleepwalking or make it worse. So things like not getting enough sleep, which is what Ken had admitted, stress and anxiety, infection with a fever, drinking too much alcohol, taking recreational drugs, certain types of medications such as sedatives can also trigger one, being startled by a sudden noise or touch causing abrupt waking from a deep sleep, and waking up suddenly from deep sleep because you need to go to the toilet. Some episodes of sleepwalking may involve just sitting up in bed and looking around and appearing confused, while other people may get out of bed, walk around, open cupboards, get dressed or eat, or they may appear agitated. And in extreme cases, the person may walk out of the house and carry out complex activities, 
such as driving a car. People's eyes are usually open while someone is sleepwalking, although the person will look sort of straight through people and appear to not recognise them. If you talk to a person who is sleepwalking, they may partially respond or say things that don't make a lot of sense. And most sleepwalking episodes last less than 10 minutes, but they can be longer. And at the end of each episode, the person may wake up or return to bed and go to sleep. And they won't normally have any memory of it in the morning, or they may have a bit of a patchy memory. And if woken while sleepwalking, the person may feel confused and then not remember what happened. So, hmm, all very interesting. And the research on this case was actually pretty cool. So Ken goes to trial the following year in 1988, and his lawyer argued to the jury that Ken was suffering from a case of homicide during non-insane automatism, yep, said that correctly, which was part of an episode of somnambulism, aka sleepwalking, and that Ken had no previous mental health issues. They argued that this was the perfect storm of stress, lack of sleep, and as well as this underlying sleep disorder. And the doctors testified that their tests showed that Ken had committed the murders whilst sleepwalking. So let's, let's pretend for a moment, okay? We're in the court, we're in the jury, we've been told this story, we've been shown all the evidence. What's your gut feeling in here? And when Dennis, the father-in-law, testified, he said he never saw his attacker, and he never said, yep, I believe it was Ken, or, yep, it definitely could have been Ken. He was very much like, I didn't see anybody. And I don't know if it was his way of, like, covering for his son-in-law, which, I don't know, like, he murdered his wife. I wouldn't have thought that he'd be up for covering for him. Or maybe it was just genuinely super dark in the room and he didn't see his attacker. So there's reasons I'm for this and I'm against this. So the reasons I believe the story are that Ken's hands were really badly cut up and he hadn't even noticed. It was like, like the police said, it was like he was in a dreamlike state, not fully conscious, but he cut the flexor tendons in his hands. Surely you'd notice that. Also the fact that Karen sticks by him after he murders her mum and Dennis isn't pointing the finger at Ken in court. And we can't ignore the tests carried out by the medical team because they were extensive and they showed clear scientific results that Ken was sleepwalking at the time of the murder. And the reasons that I'm sceptical is that in all honesty, the whole story just seems ridiculous. This man got dressed, drove 15 miles across highways and back roads. He got his tire iron at the back of the car. He unlocked the door and let himself in. He went into the kitchen, grabbed a knife, he took the phone off of the hook, and then he murdered Barbara. He stabbed her five times, he smashed her face in with the tire iron, and he then went on to stab Dennis and strangle him. How is that possible? How did the screaming and the yelling and the physical altercations not wake this man up? Well, one year and one day after the attack, the jury decided that Ken was not guilty of the murder of Barbara, nor the attempted murder of Dennis, and Ken was released. So what are your feelings right now? Are you torn? Are you outraged? Are you feeling this is justified? Because I certainly had some unanswered questions whilst researching this case. First of all, I can't find any information on whether Ken did have to face prison time for stealing from his employer. It looks like all charges in that matter were dropped. Also, if the argument was that Ken has an underlying condition which was triggered by a very high stress situation, could he be capable of doing this all over again? Some people believe that Ken went to his in-laws in his sleepwalking state because it was on his mind that he would be going over there the next day to tell them his big secret. So if he was, say meant to be going to his nan's house for the same reason. Do you think that the same thing would have occurred? Do you think that it would have triggered something in him? He would have woken up, he would have driven to his nan's house and murdered his nan. I just, I don't know. It's such a crazy case. 
because the jury were very much like, nope, totally get it. I believe you. You're a free man. And I honestly, I don't know. <laughs> I honestly don't know. And that, my friends, is the story of Kenneth Parks. What do you reckon? <laughs> and like I said, it's a crazy case. And I know you're thinking, wow, what are the chances? One in a million. Well, actually, you'd be wrong. And if you're a Patreon member, I'll be uploading a mini roundup of some other cases where sleepwalking was the reason given for murder. But let's take it back to the very beginning. How was my ale? So, brrrr, <laughs> is fully hopped. A little bit bitter, and it's packed full of fruitiness. It does remind me a lot of the Thornbridge Jaipur, as it's very piney, and it's a good solid 6%. I'd happily drink a few of these like ice cold on a hot day. And I recommend you give it a try if you see it about, if you're into sort of very hoppy, very piney ales. It's definitely got like a shed load of flavor to it. I've had a quick look online and I think in the UK it's sold mainly on honestbrew.co.uk. I can't see that it's in any of the supermarkets to be honest. I'll also be leaving a link in the show notes to a new podcast that I discovered whilst researching this case. It's called Dark Poutine, <laughs> and that episode on this was really good. You can find updates about new episodes over on Twitter and Instagram, and I'll be sure to post the photos of this case over on the Instagram page. Both pages can be found under Ale and Agony. If you would like to support the show and you have some spare cash, and you want to throw it at me and support the show, then you can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash aleandagony. And the cost for the membership of that particular page is £3 per month. And I'll be sure to give you a shout out next episode, and you can also get access to some cheeky bonus content from time to time. I would, of course, be super grateful for any feedback. If you want to comment on Twitter or on Instagram, or if you could leave a five-star review over on Apple Podcasts, I would really appreciate it because those really help to bump me up the list of recommendations to people when they search for true crime podcasts. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. And well done on getting it all the way through to the end, although I have a feeling this is going to be a shorter one. <laughs> and I hope to catch you on the next episode. Goodbye, my friends. Goodbye.